I mean, thank you for coming. My name is Gary Anderson. I am the producing artistic director for Plowshares Theater Company. I'd like to welcome you here to our third um, part of our Plowshares Artist Salon series, the art of activism in black theater. So today we're very fortunate to have uh, Reginald Edmonds from Chicago. He is a playwright and an activist as well as a director, resident, a former resident of Chicago Houses, who has his own organization, Black Lives, Black Works, which actually was inspired by uh, events coming out of the Black Lives Matter organization uh, movement. Um, today we're going to talk about activism as an aspect of Black Theater, which is the way it is usually done. Um, and a number of people have questions about Black Theater, Black Play, Black Authors Plays, or are always antagonistic, and that's not really true. However, the very nature of black theater has at its core a concept of radical black love. And in many cases, it also manifests itself in addressing issues that the community has to, has to tackle. Those things being, in many cases, the issues of disenfranchisement, good afternoon, that we are impacted by. And so today we're going to talk about the fact that activism is actually a critical aspect of what the <coughs> does. Broadway director and former artistic director of the Yale Repertory Company, Lloyd Richards, a former director, said that black theater by itself is political. And it's political because of the fact that it is self-expression, it is self-thought. Right being the way it works is that it actually expresses how you see the world and your way of attempting to try to justify or explain your perspective on the world. Reginald is a perfect example of that. Just so, just to give you a little bit of information, um, we're gonna, we're, this is eventually gonna end up online. If you have any opportunity, if you're live tweeting, we'd love for you to use these hashtags to go along with it. That would help us in the rest. If you're taking any pictures, you know, that would help us continue to get information out. And we also want to start by telling you that one of the things, one of the authors I'm going to be talking about, one of the playwrights I'm going to be talking about, Georgia Douglas Johnson, makes a statement that rise with the hour for which you were made. And it's not just about that, what that means is that you have a purpose in life, and you have a purpose that has to be manifested through the activities that you find out about her and her activism in the context. But let's talk about Reggie. As I said, he's an award-winning former resident, playwright at Chicago Dramatists. He's a writer of a number of things, both the ordained smiles, Sadie Mae Jenkins, Juneteenth Street, The Redemption of Paul Black. He's also the managing curator of the of Black Lives, Black Words, as well as a graduate from Te Texas Southern University and the Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. He is, we're, we're actually talking about working with the organization Black Lives and Black Words International Projects here in Detroit and doing a presentation as well. So this is actually the beginning of a, 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 a phase that you may see manifested in the coming months. And when I said international project, I actually meant that. Reggie has taken this project of doing play festivals all, all across this country as well as into Toronto, Canada, and London to the UK. So he's well versed in speaking to the voice of black folks and giving black playwrights an opportunity to present their voice. And so without further ado, I introduce you Reggie Edmund.
say thank you for having us be a part of this event. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Black Lives Black Words was started in 2015. Uh, a lot of things were going were happening around that time. The death of Trayvon Martin, uh, 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 Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And I noticed that there wasn't uh, a lot of opportunity for black playwrights to speak out and have their voices heard about these issues. You know, a painter, they can usually, they can go to find a wall and paint something. You know, a poet, they can stand on the corner and spit something. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of opportunity for playwrights. There's that gate. And oftentimes that gate, those gatekeepers, did not reflect us. And the events that they were, Sometimes some theaters were like, oh, we'll do something around black theater. Uh, uh, we'll do something around, around Black Lives Matter. But they were bringing in all these uh, social I, sh so I would say uh, sometimes, oftentimes, problematic voices into the mix. And I, so I had the strong desire and need to speak out and have my voice heard. And so I began to wonder how many other uh, black playwrights within uh, the, the community uh, also felt this way as well. And so uh, I got super bold, and I went to uh, five of the main black theaters in the city of Chicago. I went to uh, Black Ensemble, I went to ETA Creative Arts. I went to uh, Congo Square, Impact, and, and Pegasus Theater. And I said, this is the crazy uh, idea that I want to do, and I need you to be on board. Now, some of y'all might not know this, but Chicago Theater is hella tribal, right? So they oftentimes don't work together in Sometimes I even suspect that they don't even really like each other, right? But for this particular reason, these five organizations came together for a one-night event in, at the Greenhouse Theater in Chicago, and we fire hazard the hell out of the Greenhouse Theater. When I say we packed it in, we packed it in, uh, and then we still had more people wrapped around the building wanted to come see this event. Uh, and so, uh, I have crazy bold. Like, shit, let's do, do this even bigger. So, I went to uh, my partner, uh, Samita Hodges-Dalloway, she was like, all right, let's try it out in London. It, it worked here, so let's try it in London. So, uh, we did it at the Bush Theater in London. And again, we fire hazard the hell out of the Bush Theater in London. Um, so, and then, so this is the Bush Theater right there. And then I got even bigger. I went even bolder. So I said, I called up the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. And I said, hey, here's the deal. My name is Rushville Edmund. Uh, I'm the managing curry and producer of Black Lives Black Words International. And we want to bring this to Minneapolis. So, here's the deal, Guthrie. You have a big building, you have all this resources. Uh, we want to do it in your space. And if you don't allow us to do it in your space, then we're going to do it in your parking lot. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I guess they were like, shit, we might have 400 some odd black people in our parking lot. Uh, come on in. And, guess what? We fired out <coughs> the head off. I should probably stop saying fire hazard. But that's what we did. We sold out the Guthrie Theater. This was one of the most uh, incredible events that the Guthrie Theater had. Uh, it, we, we shifted them. We did a ticketed uh, model, which was tier-based. Uh, and people came and packed it in, and it was one of the most beautiful events uh, that, they, that they said that they've ever experienced. Uh, and as you can see, that place was uh, the model that uh, that Black Lives Black Words goes by, it really speaks 
from uh, Nina Simone, in which she says that the role of artist is to speak to their times. Let me say that again. The role of an artist is to speak to their, to their times. And so we really embrace that message. Uh, and then also, on top of that, uh, I really have a firm belief in, in the message of our ancestors and some of the stronger voices that came before us. So uh, I take, for instance, August Wilson and his statement, Black Theater, these words have a feeling to them. When you see them, you feel good. Black Theater, these words have a meaning. These words have power. And not everyone is glad to see them. There are some in our society who feel threatened by them. Powerful segments of our society who feel threatened by the meaning these words have. Black theaters, Black America's imagination on display. Black America's intellect on display. Uh, black America's humanity on display. The field of manners and rituals of intercourse that Baldwin speaks of on display. It is on this field that we have matured. It is on these fields that we have come into our own. That's August Wilson. And so, Black Lives, Black Words, we really embrace that. We really truly believe in that. And so we bring in artists that aren't just the hot new kids on the block. We reach out to the veterans, the legendaries, uh, that oftentimes these, these major theaters have, have forgotten about or left behind uh, for the hot new kid. We bring in uh, those people who are, who are rising and we also bring in uh, artists that you've probably never heard of a day of your life, but just have something that they want to say. Uh, and so that's one of the things that makes uh, Black Lives, Black Words such an uh, important uh, project. Next slide, please. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, we don't handicap people in terms of, of where they are in terms of their career. So we bring in people who oftentimes have never had the experience of being a producer, uh, and we put them into that role, or a director, and we put them into that role so that they have an opportunity to grow and, and develop into the artist that they desire to be. Uh, and uh, uh, to be honest, sometimes that experience, Black Lives Black Words, has received some pushback from people, you know? Uh, I'll be honest, we've received deference for the work that we've done. We've received uh, hate mail for the work that we've done. If I scroll through uh, every time that we've done an event, there's always been a backlash from some hillbilly somewhere in the middle of nowhere, right? Uh, and so we've been called terrorists, troublesome, so disgraceful this theater is supporting this, right? This was from, from uh, when we were, went to the Guthrie Theater. First you black lifers take over our streets, now you're invading our theaters. Mm. <laughs> Maybe the Taliban or something, I don't know. Uh, kill yourselves. I hope you lay it on the road and so I can drag over you and make black talk. That's some of the uh, evil that we experience, that we, that we stand against. But on the opposite end of that spectrum is something that's really beautiful. And we receive comments like, when will you bring back this powerful event? Please do it again, my soul needed this. I bask in this joy. Thank you for putting words into theatrical action. Inspirational night. Definitely will never forget this. It feels good knowing I got a chance to use my craft to make a difference in America. Uh, thank you for this. So, we must be doing something fucking right, you know? Uh, the fact that, that at the same time that we're receiving this, this harsh response to the work that we're doing, at the same time, we're receiving love and excitement and, and offering uh, the opportunity for black artists to celebrate ourselves in a way that we oftentimes never get to do. And also speak on the issues that are affecting our lives and our world. Um, 
for how many gatekeepers standing in the way of who we are. Uh, that's the next one. So we got super bold and we've expanded now to and we have blown up and now we have served uh, two continents, three countries, nine cities, uh, four colleges and universities all across the globe, and we're expanding and we're growing and we're growing. And all of this has happened uh, within the short period of 2015 to now. Uh, so as you can see, this is the flyer for uh, Black Lives Black Words in Canada, and this is the flyer for Black Lives Black Words in the UK. Uh, so some of the things uh, that we have done, uh, we do our, our annual, well, we do our Black Lives Black Words showcase, in which we present black playwrights from all across the globe, the work that they're doing, short plays from those works. Uh, we've done a, f a fundraiser for Flint. Uh, we, we've started doing college takeovers, in which we provide an opportunity for uh, college students to create their own uh, edition of Black Lives, Black Words. And, and this project, it, uh, it provides them the opportunity to not just be artists, and you know, for colleges they go, oh, be an artist, be, 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 do this. But it doesn't really, inspire you or, or, or push these students to become uh, activists and art leaders within their communities. And so that's what Black Lives Black Works uh, really uh, does and celebrates. And then on top of that, uh, we do, uh, we've expanded our mission. We realize that black voices aren't the only marginalized voices that are, are being uh, silenced. So uh, we created a project called the Our Town Project or the Our America Party. Uh, it was originally called the Fuck Trump Party, but uh, my co-founder is a vastly better marketer than me, uh, and so we changed it to the Our America Party, in which we go, we find the local uh, artists of color, POC artists, we also find, bring in indigenous uh, artists of immigrant descent, LGBT, uh, the list goes on and on and on. And we bring them together so that they can really talk about uh, the state of America, where they stand inside of it, what is their viewpoints on the American dream. And we, we've done that project in many cities across the globe as well. Um, we do a panel discussion called The Artist Speaks, in which we bring uh, veteran artists of uh, color, uh, black artists, to speak about their experiences. Uh, on top of that, uh, we just did an all-female produced, directed, and written Black Lives, Black Words. Uh, we've expanded our, our group, so we now have 41 artistic associates from around the globe, including uh, Dominique Morceau, Detroit's very own, right? Uh, Nami D. Kelly, Idris Goodwin, Harrison Davis River, and, and so many more. And we work with well over 300 plus artists. Now, I would say we could probably work with over 600. Uh, so, next uh, so, right here we have Canada. Uh, we fire hazard buddies in Bad Times Theater in Toronto during their, uh, during their, one of their play festivals. Uh, and it was, that was the most attended event uh, at that festival. Uh, and this is a sign po the poster for Black Lives Black Words. Uh, the reopening of the Bush Theater was a part of that as well. Uh, and it's cool because um, you'd be standing, you'd be sitting, hanging out over there, and you would see uh, groups of, of black women coming up and like taking group pictures next to the posters. And it's, it was so beautiful because. They don't often get to see posters with their faces on it in London, which is, yeah. And so we're building communities, we're building growth, we're expanding our mission, uh, and next one, please. The next one. Uh, we've we've uh, gathered support from people from all across the globe, uh, including. Mike, right? Which is freaking awesome. Uh, we've 
a huge supporter of us. And then also on top of that, what's the next one, please? Uh, so we did, did this project. This is an image from our college takeover. And this is uh, from our Bush Theater event, uh, in which we uh, just, in which we reopened the Bush Theater. Next one, please. And next one. We met Red Man. He's been a huge supporter of Black Lives Black Words. This is from our uh, reopening of the Bush Theater. This picture right here. Next. And next one. The next one, please. All right. And so our biggest and our most latest projects has been the I Am Fest. The I Am Fest was a three-day celebration of black women uh, of women of color in arts, activism, and leadership. This project uh, was a three-day takeover of the Goodman Theater. They don't like us using the word takeover, but it was a freaking takeover. All right? uh, we had workshops, uh, panel discussions, film screenings, uh, readings of classic black play, black female playwrights, and we brought in our uh, Black Lives, Black Words showcase. Our, our famous Black Lives, Black Words showcase. And every single portion of this was facilitated, led by, produced by, directed by uh, women of color. Directed towards women of color. Um, our, our workshops was, uh, we had, we had, um, Red Clay Dance teaching a workshop on uh, movement of as act, movement as activism. We had brave new spaces. We had a surviving the mic doing a workshop around creating brave new spaces, uh, safe spaces. Uh, we had film screenings of uh, Shirley Chisholm's uh, seventy two about her uh, political campaign. We also did uh, the feeling. Uh, uh, a screening of a film called The Feeling of Being Washed, which dealt with the Muslim community and how they, uh, women in the Muslim community, and how they wrestled with the, the FBI as they were being watched in Chicago. Uh, on top of that, we did our Black Lives Black Word Showcase, which was produced by, directed by uh, women of color. Directed towards women of color. Uh, our, our workshops was uh, we had we had uh, red clay dance teaching a workshop on uh, movement of, as a, movement as activism. We had brave new spaces. We had a surviving the mic doing a workshop around creating brave new spaces, uh, safe spaces. Uh, we had film screens of uh, Shirley Chisholm's uh, seventy two about her uh, political campaign. We also did uh, a, feeling, a, a screening of a film called The Feeling of Being Watched, which dealt with the Muslim community and how they, uh, women in the Muslim community, and how they wrestled with the, the FBI as they were being watched in Chicago. Uh, on top of that, we did our Black Lives Black Word Showcase, which was produced by, directed by, written by entirely black women. Uh, and then we closed out the event by putting 100 women of color on the Goodman Theater stage, one of the biggest theaters in our country, performing the transcript of Sandra Bland's arrest. Uh, and we, and we, uh, and it was just historic. It was historic. And some of the playwrights that the playwrights that participated in the showcase were uh, Nami E. Kelly, Lloyd Webb, the legendary Winsome Pennock from from London, uh, Yolanda Mercy from London, uh, T.S. Hawkins, who's from Connecticut or something like that. I didn't even know they had black people in Connecticut, but we found them and brought them into the mix. Uh, Dominique Morceau, Detroit's very own, and Majasala Adebayo, who was the creator, of, who was the the transcriber of the Sandra Bland piece. Uh, we're growing. We are uh, a theatrical movement. 
I don't want to say that we're just a theater company, but we're a theatrical movement. We're expanding. We're in talks to bring it into Columbia, because there's a huge Afro-Latino community there. We're in talks of creating our own theater space in the city of Chicago, and also expanding out our mission to uh, create things called uh, what I would call uh, multi-city multi world premieres. Uh, you know, some people, uh, some theaters, they're, they're a believer in the rolling premiere, or they're really concentrated on creating work that's their world premiere. But we really want to make sure that the voices of these black artists uh, that we encourage and believe in are expanding outward to more and more cities. And so we're being super bold, and we're going to try to knock on something uh, to to produce world premieres of black playwrights simultaneously in both the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, we're also uh, creating a learning online learning platform as well uh, that's led by, facilitated by, and taught by uh, black artists from around the world. Uh, so, my name is Rachel Edmonds. Uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, you gotta be a rebel. And if you believe in something, push forward and constantly make it happen. So that's what I did. And that is the activism that is Black Lives Black Words. Thank you. Yes, I'm very curious how you took over the book of theater in Chicago. Yeah, um, so we had. It was, it was really a, a game of strategy. So for me, I was like, all right, the goal is I'm going to uh, do the staging of 100 black women on the Goodman, on the Goodman stage. But I knew that because we didn't have like uh, the reputation yet, that I could not pull that off at the moment in time. So we did it at the, uh, the Greenhouse Theater. We sold it out. We, we built the whole reputation around it. Uh, we did it over at the Victory Gardens. We sold that theater out. And so when I came to, I knocked on the Goodman door uh, and said, I have a crazy idea. I would love to talk to you about it. And so uh, when we said, uh, what we want to do is we're going to put 100 women on the Goodman stage performing the transcript of Sandra Blank's arrest, they were like, whoa, right? And then I said, I have the track record to prove that what I say is going to make it happen, right? Um, so that was that. And then when they were about to agree to it, I said, and another thing, we're going to do a full takeover of the space. Uh, so we want the whole theater. We want every single part of your facility to be a part of this discussion that we're taking place in the celebration of women of color. And they, they just, uh, could not say no. Isn't it uh, three theater, different theaters in the same building? Uh, more than the one. It's right, they have multiple uh, theaters in that building, yeah. Right, and so, so you had all three? Or, yeah. Or, oh, okay. Yeah. Because I think the largest one is the, uh, the largest one. Is, right, right. Uh, so we, we didn't want to do it inside of that space. We don't like that space. Um, we wanted to make sure that every single member of the audience was deep into it and felt every single moment of it. So we went with the 400, uh, 500 seat theater that's in that space, uh, the Owen. Uh, so we used that place to do the showcase. Uh, and then we, used, we took over the whole education building uh, that they have in order to do um, the workshops and panel discussions Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then also the lobby as well. I just like to say you should be commended for your creativity. Thank you. Performing <laughs> at the building. And looking forward to you coming here to Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, again, you're already here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the mission is to bring Black Lives Black World Showcase to to uh, uh, Detroit, uh, and I think that's something that's going to happen soon. Oh, and also because we recognize that uh, 
these works that we're doing, oftentimes they disappear and there's no record. We created a Black Lives, Black Words anthology. And we're working on our second anthology now, uh, which we're selling here. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Did you have your hand up? Did you have your hand up? No, but I was a little close to you about the brain on the Alright, alright, sounds good. Let's see, um, I just feel like um, this movement, it really needs to be out there, you know. Uh, I feel like it needs to be some kind of um, documentary uh, on Netflix or something like that. That's the word, it needs to get out there. So that's me. Uh, thank you guys so much for allowing me to share with you all uh, the work that we're doing with Black Lives, Black Words. And I feel so incredibly honored uh, to be standing before you all. Thank you.
I'm not saying that's a coincidence, <laughs> but it sure is not look like it to me. Um, yeah, she, one of the, she was a very inspirational person. In fact, one of the things that she was best known for in, in Washington society, specifically black society, was she was the hostess of the S Street Salon. In fact, the idea of these of this series comes from her. Her front room in her home on S Street in Washington, D.C. was a place of gathering for black artists and intellectuals. So at any on Saturday evening. So at any night, you might go by her place for dinner, and there would be Elaine Locke, one of the most prominent thinkers of the, the New Negro period, Langston Hughes, Gene Toomer, Zora Neale Hurston, and the whole of people just hanging out of her house eating fried chicken, talking about anything on, on their mind. But what you found is that in many cases, this community was able to expand and develop many of their ideas. In fact, by actually raising these conversations that would exist in her, so in her front room at her home, where they could debate certain tactics. And in fact, many of the ideas that came out of those conversations would eventually end up leading to a, a new play, a new poem, or I even mean, a new idea for a novel that one of those artists would eventually you know, create. Her home was an essential fabric of African American cultural traditions that existed here. If it had not, if she had not done that, she had not invited these people into her home on a regular basis, if she had not been welcoming, many of the great works that we think of today would not have actually probably been created. She herself also became a playwright, and the issue that she tackled most specifically was the issue of anti-lynching. In fact, all, most of her plays addressed that. Um, many of her plays were written and not necessarily produced, in large part because theaters were afraid she was. She was an unvarnished radical at the time. She wrote a play, a six-page play, this is a very short, short play, called Safe, in which the basic premise is a story of a black woman in pregnancy um, during in the eight, uh, during the eighteen the, the late nineteenth century, and so the play takes place at her at the home, and the husband goes out to get a midwife to come back in to assist her. Um, the we hear the pre we hear the pregnancy occur, and then eventually we hear the the screams of the child as it's as it's birth. And the family of the elated, in fact, they're, 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 they're so joyous that it's a boy. And then what happens is that after the event of the, the birth, the mother comes out of the bedroom and she hears, as this wagon is going past the house, a black man screaming for his life, fear of being lynched. And then the next thing you hear as the voice trails off, she goes back into the bedroom where the baby is in. And you hear the child cooing. And then all of a sudden, the child goes silent. And when her husband comes back in and he asks, What's, where's the baby? What's wrong? What's, what happened to the baby? She says, he's safe. She responded immediately with the fear of bringing this black male into a world that was only going to take his life. So she figured she, she would save him from that act. This is the kind of radical aspects of, some of, the, of, of the approach to writing that she did. And save the key, maintain this other one of the plays of hers that has all, all been written and read, but has historically never been produced. Um, she also assisted, in many cases, educating people through the Washington uh, DC school system and actually continued to be quite active in through her death um, in 1968. So she had continued to have an impact even after the period of her, uh, her, her writing on Wayne. Next, we, we talk about the black arts movement that came out of the black power movement of the 1960s. And actually, this is the one we usually <coughs> think about when we think about the activism in black theater. This is way, another way in which we were looking at how we could use theater to radically address the issues and grievances that black people had and the disenfranchisement of, of the, the 60s. And in many cases, it was the civil rights movement that was inspiring, but also there were other issues that were, that were trying to be addressed 
um, economic disenfranchisement, the system of, in many cases, some of the subjects that you hear people talking about today, um, the, the, the school, the prison pipeline, a whole host of these things are actually connected. And the, one of the major things that we think of they actually was uh, Leroy Jones, who eventually changed his name to a Mary Barack. Now, I put up this picture specifically because this is of the young Leroy Jones. This is from the late 50s. This is back when he was a poet and a music critic. This is also back when he was married to a white Jewish woman. That's Katie Jones, his, his former first wife. And so, it's, I, it, it, to a certain extent, it's kind of ironic that this gentleman here ends up becoming the author of this play. Because in many cases, the play, both of these plays, these are two one acts, uh, Dutchman and Slave, which are actually plays that address, in many cases, the, the evolution of Leroy Jones to a married Robert. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Slave, very, uh, very much so, because in Slave, a man goes to his ex-wife's home she, and tries to uh, address issues that he, his, his Jewish wife, ex-Jewish wife, who has his biracial children in the home with him. And he goes back to the house to try to address certain issues that he has not been able to address in their, in their relationship. And the play seems eerily biographical. Um, but this is the one I want to focus on. When he becomes a Mary Baraka, the activist, he takes on a completely different point of view, um, a much more radical approach. But he doesn't forget who he was. If any of you have seen Dutchman, the play, the play deals with a subway ride. It's a, again, it's a one act. And on this subway in New York is a black man, well dressed, tie, suit, looks like a young Clarence Thomas, who gets on the, on the subway. And during the course of the ride, is met by a, a liberally act, acting uh, white woman named Lula who begins to prod him in certain very distinct ways about his attitudes and ideas and personality. It appears, it's kind of odd how she seems to be the more liberal of the two and attempts to try to get him to act in a way that might reveal something internally. But he pretty much keeps his cool throughout the entire piece. Um, this is an image from the 1967 film of the 1964 play. Uh, the, the actress is Shirley Knight, and the actor is Al Freeman Jr. They were the original cast members from the very first production of, of uh, Dutchman. And this was a film that was produced. I'm sorry about the fuzziness of the image, but that's actually, if you, actually, if you ever look at the movie, that's actually how the movie looks. It did this, the definition isn't any better than that. But this was actually released. Sorry. Um, all along the trip, there's a number of things that, are, that she's prodding and trying to get a sense, get, trying to get underneath the skin, trying to see if there's anything that she can actually ignite in him to show a certain, a different um, presentation or, or present in the world a different point of view than the one he seems to be presenting. Because it seems to be quite assimilated. Before the ride is over, he finally breaks out. He finally strips off the mask that he's been showing. And he's, he goes into this monologue that really kind of addresses some the, that rage that he has been holding back throughout this entire ride. And one of the one of the most radical thoughts in the in the play that is presented by, by Baraka is a statement he talks of, he, he says, and I'm gonna quote this as best I can. He says, um, hip, all the hip-hop boys talk about Bird, said Bessie Smith. So you don't even know. B Bessie Smith would not have sung one note of music if she had killed the first 10 white people she had seen walking down the street. The concept that what he did right there was connect black creative action and energy to, directly to, the issue of black rage and frustration that you search that there is no way in which we are motivated to write music, the right plays, the right to paint, if it is not coming out of 
the passion and we're trying to express ourselves in a world that constantly is forcing us to deny who and what we are. And with Clay making that statement, what he's really saying is that the mask he's been wearing, the assimilated image he's been presenting to the world, is the thing he feels he needs to get through this, to get home, to lock his door, and finally be who he can be. And by mistake, the moment, this moment in this play, when he drops the mask, when he does that, that's when he becomes most wrong because she and her friends knows that this is one you have to be concerned about. Because this is one who can get in the door of the White House. This is one who can get in the door of the corporation. And you're not going to see him coming in regards to the, danger, the dangerous radical changes he's going to make from within the system. So the play really kind of talks about how it kind of leads out the radical from within. They present themselves as an assimilated individual um, because in the play, at the end, Lula actually stabs and kills uh, Clay and his body is discarded by the other passengers that are on, on, on the subway. A number of uh, cast members have, over the years, have been used. In fact, Dooley Hill, who you may remember as the president's assistant on West Wing, he was also star on Psych. He played Clay in a 2007 production that was a revival at Sheridan Lane Theater, where the play was originally done in 1964. And what you're looking at, oddly enough, is a kind of character that looks like an Obama, right? Somebody who white people aren't threatened by initially. And then you see underneath, there is a Malcolm also, I want to talk about, I, I mentioned her uh, when we were doing the Women in Black Theater, Barbara Ann Tier, founder and executive director, uh, original executive director for National Black Theater in New York. The, this theater was not about, as far as she was concerned, about creating great art. It was about using theater as a transformative process to free the minds of enslaved black people. Much of what she did during her lifetime, much of what the, the company does today, was really trying to address the redresses of, of issues directly through artists, using the theater as a mechanism by which she did. So today, her daughter, um, Sade Lithoff, is now the, the executive director of the theater. And they do programs such as I Am Soul Playwrights Residency, where they actually hire playwrights to do a residency with National Black Theater, but the plays are all designed on having some kind of radical impact on the culture. They also do a number of things when they're developing black writers and black actors who can uh, pursue the careers elsewhere. In fact, a number of the artists that have worked with them over time have eventually ended up being cast in some of the regional theaters in New York as well as on Broadway. So they've been a wonderful fertile ground for cultivating the generation of artists that have come from us. This is their former location on 125th Street. They recently sold the, the building for a couple of rice to get it renovated. So they're actually, it's, what you're seeing now, it doesn't look like that. It's actually an alternative. Um, they're getting a brand new space that's going to be newly constructed out of the money that they just very, very smart. In fact, one of the one of the clauses that they used to raise the dollars out of the city was one that Barbara Antier, when she was alive, got into the zoning laws in New York that nobody ever thought that they would use. But she was able to utilize it. But they were able to utilize it after her death in this project. Also, you know about the Indizaki Shange. She is a representative of a number of black women who have become playwrights. Um, her play, the most famous play for colored girls, is designed really to try to address the, her way of processing many of the experiences that she had with women throughout her, the men throughout her life, and using the mosaic of the color of the rainbow to reflect those different women and the personality traits. Um, for Colored Girls was, is a product that was not being um, ex 
accepted for the most part. I mean, it started out in a series of poems being read, read in coffee shops in the Bay Area. And it wasn't until it was actually picked up by another former contributor, William King Jr., that it was developed in New York into a production that we know today. Uh, not just by his efforts of directing himself, but actually hiring and investing in the production in a really tangible way. Uh, third period I want to talk about, and this one we have a tendency to ignore because it's not didn't happen here in the United States. But this was a process by which black theater was used by black people in Africa to actually address the inequities that exist in Africa. So that's why I want to I want to be real clear. We have a tendency to ignore the fact that the, the, the radicalism, the desire to be activist, is is an integral part of how we present work, but it's also a part of how, in many cases, our brothers and sisters on the world continent have been able to address many of their issues. The anti-apartheid movement was definitely one one of the benefactors of that. Um, a number of writers in townships that existed throughout South Africa used the performance of new work, the creation of new work, as a way of trying to address the grievances, the, the, the oppression that was a part of that. Uh, and a couple of the artists, we, we look at what they were suffering with. Channel, we have challenges here in this country. We, we have had worse circumstances over the years in this country. These people were dealing with this in a very structured manner as well. Um, the, the issues of addressing uh, just being able to go from one province to another and not being able to, and the, being able to, uh, the situations of the, you know, being able to come in between races or, and not even races, but just having different ethnic makeups, biracial people who wanted to love and live together could not be able to do that because of the specific mix of their own biracial heritage. The one of the plays that I want to, well, one of the plays I want to talk about specifically was one that Poshiers actually did as a Marvel production back in 1990, which was Rosa Albert, which it was a satire, used theater in a, uh, in the, its primary form as a comic, comical matter to address the grievances. Um, Wolf Albert poses the idea, at the time, South Africa called itself a Christian nation. And so this play poses the idea of what would happen if Jesus Christ came back to South Africa. So when he returned, he returned to the, the country of South Africa. How would this Christian nation respond to the Son of God? And the whole play deals with how in Midian Cotton, Using clowning, using farcical circumstances, and using the basic mask work that exists uh, at, the, at the foundations of theater to address that. You see that around their necks they have these red noses. When the actors put the nose on, that was the content that they were playing white people. So they use those easily to kind of create that. These two actors are the, all the actors that would be used for World Out. They play some 26 characters across the different than little short vignettes, but they're all played, they're all skits that are focused on showing up the hypocrisy of calling yourself a Christian nation. Um, and uh, with Imbo Gaming and Gaiman, who was one of the authors, and one of the, and, and one of the original actors in this piece, is an important, not only actor that comes out of the townships, but also he eventually becomes the creator of the musical Seraphina, who was, which was a phenomenal achievement. Again, talking about how do we use, how do we document the activities of activism uh, in a theater piece, this play deals with a uh, student uprising in a township based on the challenges that existed for these communities. And they use the process of music to create the environment that they were using. And so, you'll see that this film, this, this play eventually becomes a major film that was starred 
a couple members of the original South African cast, but the big name was Whoopi Goldberg, and uh, it had a huge, huge impact, again, on trying to address the circumstances. It wasn't just mere entertainment. The idea was trying to use the theater as a way of changing, making changes. One of the things I haven't said that I need to go back to is that storytellers and activists have many things in common. One of them particularly is that they both are trying to affect change in the world in which they live. In some cases, the artist wants to do it on a smaller level. And in the case of the activists, they may want to try to create a movement. And the original was called Black Lives Black Lives. To do that, they have to be the artist, if he's going to be a fan, he or she is going to be effective. They have to be extremely good storytellers. Because, you can, because the story is the most powerful way in which you can move somebody forward. Providing them just with the information is not enough. Perfect example, and many of you may have the experience, um, most recently Netflix released the four part series of When They See Us. Ava DuVernay's powerful, powerful film on the experiences of the exonerated five, you know what we call them, the civil rights five. The same information that's in her movie was presented as well, as, well, as, as clearly in the documentary from 2015 done by Sarah and Ken Burns. That also was on Netflix for several years. Nobody was releasing um, anybody from the board of NASA. Nobody was getting fired at Columbia as a lecturer. None of that was happening. Even though the same information was presented in the document. Four years later, we tell the story, right? We tell the story of what these young boys suffered. We put you in the room when they are confronted with lies and with persecution and abuse. And you feel it. That's the difference. The artist, if he or she wishes to be an activist, to affect the change, they have to make you feel it. That's why is that every activist may not be a storyteller, but every storyteller, in some way, shape, or form, can have the capacity to be a great activist. That's one of the major differences between the two. What she accomplished with the release of that movie over one weekend in regards to getting people, again, fired from boards, losing um, uh, uh, book relationships with publishers, being fired out of, out of law departments at major universities in the country, all happened because people watched a movie. That, that, that's real power. That's the power of actually taking the information and putting it in a way that, that is able to motivate you to a point where you have no other choice but to do exactly what is inspiring. And that's why, in many cases, I have some challenges with, I hate, I hate to even hear myself say this, as a, the younger generation and their approach to the craft of theater. Because in many cases, what we've seen is a lot of young, some of uh, Reginald's contemporaries have essentially not want to be aggressive in regards to using their craft to be, to put something out that might challenge the audience. New work is not always appears to be tackling some of those issues that Black Lives Black Words does. And I can't see why we aren't using this powerful tool that is at our availability. If you've been given a guy given talent to act, direct, write, produce, and we're not using those to tackle some of the real world problems that we have, then why are we why, why are we why are we sitting back and letting these things occur? 
because of a huge number of problems that exist. And I'm not just talking about our current occupant of the White House. Yes, he has caused a reason difficulty, but the reason why he's there is because a lot of those difficulties and challenges existed prior to that. So if we're, as, as an artist, I feel compelled to use this form to make it, try to make a difference. And one of the reasons why we wanted, I wanted to do this piece particularly was because I wanted to address the fact that this is not an admiration of the art form. This is actually a core mission of the art form. The black theater has to be trying to affect real change in the lives of real people. Or otherwise, the effort is just pointless. And I say all that because we're, this is our 30th anniversary season. We're about to announce our, our upcoming activities um, for the season. And um, I, I feel compelled to use this series and then the other things that we're doing to make you aware of exactly why we do it. Because in the last several years, we've seen that other companies want to pick up that model and do a couple of black plays every once in a while. And that's fine. God bless them. But there really is a difference about why we do it. We're not just trying to make, um, pull in a lot of folks uh, for the sake of making a lot of money. Yes, we would like to make a lot of money. So, <laughs> but what we're really trying to do is about trying to address some of those issues in this space. Because they have to be addressed. And if we aren't doing a lot of part of the society as a citizen of the community, then we're, we're missing out on our to make things, attempt to make things better than they are. Many of the artists that I've talked about today and, and what Reggie was talking about beforehand, that is the reason why we actually do this. They also feel that way. And so going forward, if you're interested in knowing more information about posture and being engaged in our activities, we'd love for you to go to our website and join our, our email list, um, have conversations with us, about what we're doing and how you can be a part of it. And the other thing, to be quite honest with you, no one succeeds at anything without being supported by the community in which they reside. That's the one thing that the reason why we find many institutions of color challenge on a regular basis. I'll just be real with you. It does get me. I did a survey a few years ago of 70 black theaters around this nation to an organization. The vast majority of them had individual operating budgets where charitable giving was 10% or less. The vast majority was under 8%. The average for most arts organizations in this country, I'm talking about like BIA, stuff like that, Anywhere between 20 and 30% of their operating budget comes from them doing giving. Barack Obama got into the White House because people gave money to support his campaign $25, $5, $10. The efforts of giving to support specifically things that are trying to address issues that may be of value to you really need to be sustained because they're. Nobody's trying to help somebody change the status quo. Nobody wants you to, nobody wants us to make this country more diverse. There are a whole lot of people actually would like for it to be just as inequitable as it is today, tomorrow, in 10 years and 50 years. So you want to keep it that way, don't fight, don't, don't help people. We're trying to change the equation. Like Reggie said about developing a movement, that's how we create movements. People coming on board and seeing value in a collective action. And, that's, and this theater company is not just about doing plays for the sake of mere entertainment. It is about affecting change on a small, systemic basis. So we hope that you'll be, find yourself being engaged with us as we go forward. But we won't have to talk about any of this as, as afterwards, after this presentation. But I appreciate you coming part of this series. Uh, if you want to get engaged here are here is all our social media. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event which we're going to be doing in 
August. We won't be doing them in July. I said July because we travel a lot. I'm traveling a lot, quite a bit in July. But anyway, thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry, unfortunately, Rick, we had to go fetch his, catch a, his transportation back to Chicago. So we had to leave early. Anyway, thank you again for coming. Thank you. We'll keep you in touch about the next event.